These days, it can be hard to trust the media. What's true, what's fake, and who is behind the message? I'm a freelance journalist and videographer who has spent years studying the media. Now I'm taking a look at what local, regional, and national news stories mean to us here in North Central Washington. I'm Dominic Bonney, and this is Common Sense. Hello and welcome to Common Sense. I'm Dominic Bonney, and today my guest is Washington State Representative Tana Sen, who represents Washington's 41st District. She's one of the authors and sponsors of House Bill 1283, which would make the open carry or display of weapons by groups of people with the intent to intimidate a Class B felony under the Offense of Criminal Mischief statute. It's just one bill and a package of bills that are in large part a response to paramilitary groups who have brought guns to the state capitol and out onto the streets of large cities and small towns in our state over the last couple of years in order to intimidate lawmakers and dissuade fellow citizens from exercising their freedoms of speech and assembly. Let's get right into that interview. Thank you for being here with me today. Um, my first question is, uh, what made you decide to write this bill or co-sponsor this bill, um, and where is it in the process as of now? Yeah, thanks, Dominic, for having me today. Uh, so House Bill 1283 uh, is actually an outcome from last session, towards the end of our legislative session in Olympia, uh, a few hundred armed people wearing tactical gear and with, uh, you know, semi-automatic auto weapons on their back, showed up at the state capitol, came into the capitol, um, were yelling, were blocking doorways and hallways, were pounding on the legislative um, doors to let it, to get into the house floor, and uh, were really intimidating. School groups, families, staff, lobbyists, interns, legislators, and it was kind of amazing that Washington State does not uh, ban open carry or guns at the state capitol at all. And it was really clear to me, though, that it was of concern and blocking people's ability to do their jobs as legislators and certainly stifling uh, voice and public discourse. So then uh, over the rest of the year, that was kind of a precursor to um, what happened in our streets, in our communities, around um, protests, at city halls, at courthouses, and just frankly on uh, main streets and on corners. And when we started looking at it, there really wasn't that much recourse for communities around what happens when there are armed uh, groups threatening and scaring uh, people who are trying to peacefully protest or share their views, um, hold up political signs. And so we really started to look around at what could we do to strengthen and make clear that there are laws that you cannot threaten people with deadly weapons and intimidate them, especially around using their uh, First Amendment rights, but just in general. Mm -hmm. hey, we had plenty of that happen throughout last summer as well. In fact, I put together a Google map with pins called NCW's Summer of Hate. And we had incidents in Chelan, Leavenworth, Wenatchee, East Wenatchee, people following other people, screaming at them with guns. Uh, one woman, you know, uh, said that she was, she had a gun actually pointed at her. So, you know, pretty, pretty scary stuff um, for people who there's no, in, in our community, at least there was no instances of any sort of violence on, on the part of folks protesting for Black Lives Matter. So uh, seems a little bit lopsided. Um, so we already have laws on the books that make private militias illegal. How is How would this bill change or how is it different? Yeah, so actually before I became a legislator, I was pretty active in getting legislation on the books to make sure that there was not training of militias in Washington state. Uh, and what we have seen over the years is that it's hard to um, to prove that that an exercise is training, because that was really what it was about, saying that you couldn't have militias training in Washington state. And so um, while there are some who believe that if you're marching down the street with, you know, kind of a group, uh, your army, and you are acting like a militia, that that's basically a training, uh, it's been... It, I think prosecutors have been reluctant to bring that charge. And so we are, again, looking at how could we make sure that we have a piece of legislation that is implementable. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and that was going to be my next question. If passed, will this legislation make it more likely for law enforcement and prosecutors to hold paramilitary paramilitaries accountable? Because so far, from every, from everything I've seen in my research, is you know they say these are un, un, unenforceable laws. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so definitely hoping that, that that this is the case, that we make it more implementable. So right now, we have modified the bill from the original uh, introduction, but right now it's taking the brandishing statute uh, that is on the books, that it's illegal to brandish a weapon, and we're, um, and we're making sure that if you're doing that within a group, which is even more intim intimidating and basically results in more kind of tensions and more emotions to be escalated and so therefore more dangerous that part of the punishment would be taking away your gun rights and that's mm -hmm. really what we you know one of the uh, you're you're not sorry not taking away your gun rights but your ability to own a gun and that's really you know you have to be a responsible gun owner and that's what this is about and when people say well i need it for self defense or when i need it for other purposes that's fine, but when you are not being responsible, then you don't get that, you don't get to have it. I mean, if you're a drunk driver, you, lo you lose your license. And yeah. that's what this is about. Um, to your knowledge, has anyone affiliated with par paramilitaries been held accountable for intimidating people in public spaces up to this point in, in Washington state history? Uh, I, I'm not sure about in Washington state history, but I certainly can tell you that uh, you know, I personally have always stood to make sure that we do that, that we hold people accountable. I'm glad that some people, and, and sadly, too many from Washington State are being held accountable for the federal level and what they did in January 6th at the U.S. Capitol. Um, again, as I was mentioning in, in Washington, uh, Representative Matt Shea was, as you may recall, was accused of uh, white supremacy and acting uh, in, a, in a way that was against, um, against the government. And we, you know, we really put forward to hold him accountable, a letter that all the Democrats signed saying that he should be removed from the legislature for uh, actions unbecoming of elected official. And I think that is exactly right. We need to hold ourselves to the standard of this. And, um, and when we don't, just like what we're seeing on the federal level, it just invites people to uh, to continue those actions. And we need to stop this paramilitary and militia activity uh, in our in our country. Yeah, I remember that letter, um, but I don't recall if any Republicans signed it. Did, did any? Thank you. No, not one Republican signed wow. on to that. Wow. And he had been, you know, he had been uh, removed from his committees he was not allowed to have staff um you know there had been an in independent investigation so clearly there was great concern about him but the republicans were not willing to uh to to sign their name saying that he should be removed um luckily he decided not to run again and yeah. i i hope that it's partly because he realized that he was not welcome and could not be an effective legislator for sure yeah yeah, I mean, for viewers who don't know who Matt Shea is, here's a guy who wrote a document called The Biblical uh, Basis for War, if I'm not mistaken, right. where he basically said it's okay to yeah, essentially execute your, your political rivals, especially atheists or anybody who's against a white mm -hmm. ethno state. So, yeah, I mean, he makes Marjorie Taylor Greene look like a uh, pedestrian. <laughs> so, or, maybe, pretty, or maybe a sister. Uh, yes, a, a, a close cousin, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Um, do you think that the current laws would be enforced if, you know, say Antifa or a biker gang decided to muster with weapons outside churches on Sunday to protect, as they say, if they claim to protect worshipers from Proud Boys? Because in, in our town, what we had was a lot of people show up with guns because they said that there are busloads of Antifa coming. We have to protect our businesses from the busloads of Antifa coming from Seattle and Portland none showed up but the people with guns showed up and the people that they confronted were peaceful protesters so do you think that if antifa showed up with weapons outside of churches on sunday that they would be held accountable for that so with like with any law just because it's on the books doesn't mean all of a sudden somebody who does something that's criminal is arrested and 
What we know, what we're seeing is that there is justice by geography, meaning uh, laws are enforced differently across our state and our country. We also know that there is uh, some in the law enforcement field who um, have allegiances or lean towards white supremacy as well. And again, we've seen that with, I think, what was it, over 40 elected officials and certainly hundreds of, of law enforcement at the U.S. Capitol, um, some from our state uh, on January 6th. And so we know that that just because there's a law in the books, it does not mean it's going to be uh, it's going to be used equally and in every instance. And so this is just part and parcel of this of some of the changes that we need to make in our state. And so this is just a tool. And I think some of the police reforms that we're putting in place, um, some of the other, you know, kind of training requirements and other things are, are what's going to change uh, all of these interactions and our our and our communities together. And so in some communities, this is going to be the perfect tool in other communities the reforms around police is going to be what's going to really change things in other communities it's going to be something else but we need to make sure that the tools are in place for those particularly egregious um, times and frankly hopefully to really be also at acting as a deterrent uh, by highlighting that this is a crime and that this is not okay, hopefully people will think twice about bringing their weapon, uh, you know, to a protest, bringing their weapon out and using it in a threatening way. Um, Self-defense is one thing, but when you are threatening people and trying to intimidate them, we need to make sure that we're using our words and not violence and intimidation to make change. Yeah. Um, can you speak to prior co coordination and communication? Because last summer in june what we had was um blm folks publicly planning uh an event on june 6th on june 4th the private militia uh facebook group was established which i slipped into you know unbeknownst to them and took a bunch of screenshots some of the you know comments were when do we start the purge stack bodies by the dumpster wow. how are we coordinating Let's use Zello. No, I'll set up a Discord server. You know, we'll make sure to coordinate and get on the server together at 2 p.m. the, the afternoon of, so nobody can, else can get in. This, this shows, and you know, others were, uh, how are we gonna identify each other? Should we use patches, show up in camo? Who's open carrying? Who's concealed carrying? Let's take a gray man approach. I mean, they were very far into this, uh, what I would call a conspiracy, but uh, you know, to show up and intimidate people. Is, is that, that already illegal, A, and, and B, what kind of protections do we have or, or um, avenues to prosecute people who are clearly um, coordinating a uh, illegal conspiracy? Stay tuned after the break to hear her response. You love to help others. You need a solid career. You can have it all with help from Charter College. Our 10-month medical assistant program prepares you to work in healthcare settings like physician offices, rehab centers, and clinics. You'll learn to take patient vitals, assist with exams, administer injections, and maintain medical records. When you're ready to launch a rewarding healthcare career, visit chartercollege.edu because we work to get you to work. You don't have to be a member to enjoy the view and dine-in style at Highlander Bar and Grill in East Wenatchee. Highlander Grill offers breakfast, lunch, and dinner with dine-in or takeout options. Highlander Grill's friendly staff is here to serve you seven days a week this winter. Contact Shalane, Highlander Grill's site coordinator, to schedule your corporate event or special occasion.
Wenatchee Power Sports not only has a new owner, but an all-new attitude to match. Speaking of attitude, check out the 2021 models arriving now. Polaris snowmobiles, ATVs and side-by-sides. Yamaha motorcycles, watercraft, ATVs and side-by-sides. KTM motorcycles and the latest edition beta high-performance motorcycles. Coming this fall, a huge demo event featuring the latest and hottest off-road machines. It's all at the retuned Wenatchee Power Sports where maximum performance is a way of life. 3031 GS Center Road in North Wenatchee open Tuesday through Saturday. Hello and welcome back. Let's jump back into my interview with Representative Sen and hear her response to my question about militias coordinating and communicating beforehand and in real time in order to intimidate their fellow citizens in public spaces. I, I you know, have to admit that I am not a legal scholar in this in this area. Um, that it, I, I'm Jewish, and I can tell you that too often we have seen that radicalization that these kind of uh communications these kind of conversations this um ginning up of of concerns the rhetoric leads to death leads to violence leads to hate crimes and i think sometimes people say oh they're just talking or uh, they're just defending themselves or, and there's just excuse after excuse after excuse of or, or, or of, of what they're doing. And, you know, this results in people losing their lives. And, um, and so I sure, sure hope that the law enforcement are taking these kind of things very seriously, that there are, you know, shown actions that are building up towards what you're talking about. Um, you know, again, this is, I would say that that is clear indication of, you know, of militia activity. Um, but again, I have to admit, I'm not a, a an expert on, on that. Yeah. Yeah. And you kind of touched on that, you know, when, when these people held, you know, showed up with, with guns, you know, to essentially march, uh, you know, 10 feet away to escort BLM protesters down the street, many said that's their right. Uh, just like BLM has the freedom of speech. Um, is that analysis wrong? <laughs> and if so, how? Yeah. So, you know, uh, frankly, in Washington State right now, they do have the right to open carry and march down the street. I, you know, whether we want that to be the reality is, is another question. It's it go, but when you go beyond that, when they start being intimidating, when they start threatening, when they start to brandish their weapon and point it at people, when they start to harass and um, you know follow people, then that's intimidation, that's threat, um, you know, that's harassment. There's a whole a uh, number of other crimes that that is. Um, whether or not is gun related when it becomes or deadly weapon when it becomes a use of your weapon that you are you know kind of shown it off your hip uh, in a threatening way again when you're brandishing that weapon uh, point which is like pointing it at somebody then you just launch into that's criminal um, and so what we're you know we're trying to walk that fine line between you have a right to carry a weapon and um, if you have gone through a background check and you are, you have are found that that is okay to do. And, um, but it's, you have to be a responsible gun owner. And that's really what we're trying to get at. Understand self-defense. Nobody's trying to take away self-defense, but when you are actively threatening and you are instigating, that's a whole nother matter. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I have to say, I'm born and bred Eastern Washington, right? I grew up around guns, love guns, love shooting guns, you know, I, you know, family of hunters, right? I've never, um, this culture of, of taking a uh, semi-automatic weapon onto American streets, onto yeah. the public sidewalk is something that is uh, not anything that I was taught and yeah. I grew up on it. Yeah, farm. my my uh, husband's family is from Norway. We go there a lot. They have lots of hunting. They go hunting all the time. Uh, we I've gone to shooting ranges. I'm quite good. Um, oh. And they are just appalled by our gun laws in America. They just don't understand. They're like, okay, if you're using a weapon for hunting, I get it. But you yeah. lock that gun up. And if you don't, 
it gets taken away. Yeah. And, you know, they have really strict rules there for safety. And guess what? There's no gun violence in Norway. So, you know, again, just like you, it's, it's, you know, I get it hunting, I get it for entertainment, you know, at a shooting range, but it's about how are you using it? And when you're threatening people and you are using it in a way that's trying to stifle somebody else's voice and intimidate them, that is not the intent of our laws. And that is not recreation. And that is hunting people, not animals. Yeah. Yeah. So given the current political climate and, you, you know, you mentioned before the insurrection on January 6th, do you think that we'll see more people forming par paramilitaries and, and roaming our streets with guns, um, you know, trying to intimidate people? You know, I'm of, of two minds about it a little bit. Um, what we saw at the beginning of our legislative session in uh, about January 11th, I think it was, uh, we were, we had, there had been lots of internet chatter about uh, insurrections also happening at every state capital around the country. And it really did not, um, it did not materialize. And I think that, again, I'm of two minds. One, I think January 6th and the fact that people are being held accountable, that people are recognizing that that was not a successful endeavor. Uh, that there is nobody, whether it's President Trump or anybody else, who's coming to their rescue when they get arrested. Um, that their rhetoric of law enforcement, blue lives matter, all of that is null and void when you are beating and killing um, uh, law enforcement. And so I think there is some stepping back. On the uh, of, I would say, of the people who are not completely radicalized, right? Of those who are either leaning towards that way or sympathizing. I think those who are what I would say radicalized, those who are, you know, have been entrenched and they are, you know, they are all about this. This is, you know, kind of core to who they are to be white supremacists, to be involved in a militia. I think it, it will empower or uh, incite them to keep going. So I, I think it's, it makes it a little bit more fringe, but I think the fringe are probably a little bit more, uh, excited if you will i see yeah but that's just my thoughts yeah well those are pretty much my questions um the last question i always have is is there anything about this issue that we didn't cover that you'd like the public to know yeah well i, I also really hope that we pass some of our other uh, laws that are that are um before the legislature around uh, guns and and again especially around guns at our state capitol uh, the idea was that we, we kind of have a package. We want to make sure that we protect the First Amendment, um, protect people's ability to uh, to come to the legislature, to use their voice, to have that public discourse, again, using their words in debate, not violence and intimidation. And so we want to prevent having open carry at the state capitol. But we also recognize that we really need to make sure that it's not just about protecting on the state level, not protecting legislators, but how are we protecting our communities? And that's what this legislation gets to as well. Um, I have many local government colleagues, uh, both in my district and just around the state, um, from Spokane to Bellingham, who are really concerned of what they've been seeing in their streets and at their near their city halls, and they don't have the tools to address that. Um, the state controls gun laws and local governments are not allowed to institute uh, any individual ones. And so we have to think about not just about on the state level, but how are we protecting our communities? And that's the goal of 1283, um, to work part and parcel in with banning guns at the state capitol that, you know, red states and blue states around the country, uh, country already do. And, you know, frankly, I don't want us to be like a Michigan or like a Virginia where there have been those or the state capital or the, the nation's capital now where we do have, you know, a, a right wing um, militia insurrection, if you will, at our at our uh, place of business at our state capital that um, I don't think that is what Washington state is about. We're about debate and words and not violence and intimidation. We're about debates and words, not violence and intimidation.
Well said. Like I said in my interview, I grew up around guns. Guns can be a lot of fun. They can be an incredibly useful tool for hunting and exterminating pests. One time my stepdad paid a buddy and me a buck a pigeon and we went out on the farm and made ourselves 200 bucks in an afternoon. We probably spent about that much on shells, but we were just farm kids being farm kids. And even though we were farm kids, we knew that it was wrong to use a firearm to bully and intimidate other people. We knew that because we were raised right. We knew guns should not be brought out in order to intimidate those who disagree with us. Last summer, we witnessed a self-styled militia take to the streets of Wenatchee to stalk and intimidate peaceful protesters because they disagreed with their message. The busloads of Antifa rumors were just that, rumors, and any reasonable person understood that it was just a ruse at the time. It was a ruse concocted in order to give an emotionally unstable extremist minority of wannabe Rambos, one of whom is a Douglas County commissioner, an excuse to plan and coordinate the systematic intimidation of their fellow citizens. Many of the people who showed up to protest and march in support of Black Lives Matter were minors and some were elderly. Hardly a crack team of Antifa super soldiers. Yet these cosplaying thugs and goons frightened a young girl so badly she and her grandma, who was in a wheelchair, left the march. And that's the whole point, isn't it? The point is to intimidate people into staying home. One of the responses to me when I posted about that on social media at the time was, well, they shouldn't bring kids. And if they're so scared, they should have stayed home. You shouldn't bring kids to a peaceful protest in support of equality for all under the law. It's a peaceful protest, not the Normandy invasion. And not to mention, the militia, the militia people themselves brought kids. Their hypocrisy knows no bounds. The only thing that ellipses their hypocrisy is their cowardice. Because if you need a semi-automatic long gun, body armor, and a 9mm on your hip to protect yourself from some social justice warriors and teenagers, you are a coward. But the plan might have backfired here, because if House Bill 1283 and the other bills in this package pass, these militia bullies could have their rights to bear arms taken away for pulling what they pulled last summer on the streets of Wenatchee. And they only have themselves to blame, because it has been their actions and the actions of other extremists across the state over the last few years that have swayed public opinion against them. According to recent polls from King 5, a majority of Washingtonians agree that open carrying during protests and demonstrations should not be allowed. Even a majority of Eastern Washingtonians, 47% of those surveyed, agree that open carrying at protests should not be allowed. If you support common sense measures to curb private paramilitaries from disturbing the peace and intimidating others in our region in public spaces, I encourage you to let our state lawmakers like Senator Brad Hawkins Representative Keith Gaynor and Representative Mike Steele know that you support House Bill 1283. Their contact information is in the show notes of this episode, but they can also be easily found with a quick Google search. I'm Dominic Bonney. Join me next time for more Common Sense. Transit is ready when you are. With enhanced health and safety measures, we've installed upgraded air purifiers and safety partitions between drivers and passengers. Plus, the interior of all of our buses are thoroughly cleaned and disinfected every day. When riding Link Transit, please remember to wear a mask, maintain physical distance, sign up for transit alerts, and stay home if you are sick. Healthier Transit is here. Go to linktransit.com to learn more. Having a relationship with your pediatrician is so important. Feeling that sense of trust, that is priceless. I tell everybody about CBCH. I love it there. When I make an appointment, I don't have to take an entire day off. As a working mom, my life is really busy. Family time is everything. That's what we all work towards. And I feel like CBCH respects that. Join the NCW Life channel for coverage of the Cashmere Valley Bank Royalty Selection Pageant Saturday, February 27th. The countdown to coronation begins at 6 with the pageant to follow at 7. Coverage is sponsored by Harvest Valley Pest Control, Laura Mountra Real Estate, and Earthwise Pet. 
The Cashmere Valley Bank Royalty Selection Pageant is available only on the NCW Life Channel, your local TV station.